Hi folks, um, today I thought uh, I would just uh, explain a little bit about um, life in, in Edinburgh's famous Royal Mile in the 1700s. And you may wonder why I'm doing this. Um, it's because at, at that particular time in Edinburgh, there was a quite a unique lifestyle, we may call it, or social mix or whatever we want to call it, um, in Edinburgh in the, in the Royal Mile. Um, and I think it's fairly unique and uh, it's not one that's really talked about a lot and um, doesn't get a lot of mentions and, and, and amongst all the other historical things about Edinburgh and I thought I'd chat about that today. Um, so if you have ever visited Edinburgh um, you may have taken one of these very popular ghost tours um, that they have in, in the old town where you'll be regaled um, with all these gruesome tales um, of you know uh, all the dark side I suppose of Edinburgh murders you know body snatching um, public executions horrific jails torturing witchcraft plagues oh, you know that's just to name a few um, I mean and, and they all are in a way uh, true uh, but that's a lot of that is really you know I, I, a great bit of fun for tourists and they are good those tours I've been on them they are good but what I really want to try and explain today is what was life really like um, for people living there in this famous thoroughfare during the 1700s and, and how did that uh, how did that come about uh, and why do I think it was you know pretty unique and, and something that wouldn't have been seen I don't think in, in many other cities um, so just to give a bit of background to it, um, in, in, in 1700, Edinburgh was starting to grow. Um, its population then was about 35,000. So it's, it still wasn't that big. Uh, but by the end of that century, it, it had tripled. So it was, it was 100,000 by the end of that century. Um, but for a lot of the time, for a lot of the time in the 1700s, the city really only comprised of of the Royal Mile uh, and, and with these myriad uh, lo small lanes that we call closes so for you to understand this a little street a little lane that runs off a street in Scotland is called a close and uh, the Royal Mile in Edinburgh is quite famous for them so there was lots of these little closes running off them um, and I'm just going to shove up on the screen uh, an old map of Edinburgh at that time I think this is about 1742 and you can quite clearly see um, this is what comprises Edinburgh really the Royal Mile a bit of what's called the Cowgate where the, the cattle were brought in um, but all these little uh, closes running off it so into this tiny space and remember, the Royal Mile is only one mile long. That's why it's called the Royal Mile. So it's one mile, one mile from the castle to the gates of, of the palace at the other end, uh, Holyrood Palace. Um, and it, it was probably only about a quarter of a mile wide. So you're talking about this small space of a mile by a quarter mile, you know. Um, and into that were crammed all the inhabitants of Edinburgh. Right, all of them. This is where they lived. So there was rich and poor, um, young and old, honest or crooked, good or evil. Uh, and the, all the men, women and children of Edinburgh at, th at that time all lived together, cheek by jowl, jam-packed into large, I suppose you'd call them blocks of flats. We call them in, in Scotland, we call them tenements. So if you hear the phrase tenement, it means a stone building with apartments or flats, whatever you want to call it, on each level. Um, and they, they, they lined the Royal Mail. Um, so this, this is the issue that, that I'd like to try and talk about today, is that, that what happened uniquely during this time was that there was a real social intimacy uh, amongst all the citizens of Edinburgh um, there were no high class areas reserved for you know for the aristocrats um, or the nobles um, there were no genteel suburbs um, where the well to do could live their well to do lives as it were uh, 
and there were no slum neighbourhoods where the poor and, 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 and downtrodden would have to live their, their, their lives in squalor. So ha what happened in this period was that everyone was forced to live together, whether they liked it or not. Um, so, as I said, they, they all resided in the same tenement buildings, albeit they did tend to live on different levels. So, the, the ground floor level was normally would normally have been reserved for commerce, uh, shops or offices or workshops or whatever. Um, uh, the first and second floors, they were the, the, the floors that were deemed or seen to have the highest social status. So the, the, the wealthier people, the aristocrats, the nobles, that is where they would, uh, they would live. And thereafter, um, I suppose you could say that the, 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 the floors socially declined, if you want to use that expression, um, as one lived further up the stair. Um, and that, that was really how it, how it worked out. Um, but I, but because in a way because the wealthy and the rich and the famous and the powerful people uh, of Edinburgh at the time weren't insulated um, from the poorer members of society, um, because they lived in such close proximity, they enjoyed what I would define as a real face-to-face -face relationship. Um, if, you know, you might say if it has enjoyed the correct term to use, but but it it, it existed, um, and I think it was this aspect, this sort of you might call total social inclusion, um, which gives I feel that the life in the Royal Mile during the 1700s such a unique flavour, um, but not only. Uh, did the members of, of Edinburgh society at this time live together, but they also socialised together uh, and carried out business together. Uh, and it, it, this again, this just, uh, to me, magnifies the whole thing. So they frequented the same inns, the same alehouses, uh, and yes, yes, the same brothels probably as, as you know, there were quite numerous brothels at that time in Edinburgh. Um, and because also of the, of the cramped conditions, much of, of the social life and the commercial life uh, of the city was conducted out in the street. That's where it all kind of happened, um, in full view of everyone. Uh, so markets took place regularly at, at, in the Royal Mile, and people would go there to conduct a business, to buy things, to sell things. Um, and every day, every day, the citizens of Edinburgh, whether they're rich or poor, young or old or whatever, would be out and about walking up and down this thoroughfare. And this is this was their life. This is where it existed. Um, and, 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 a, and a very interesting aspect, I think, uh, that spun out of this was that because of this, kind of what I would define as unique social intimacy, um, Many, Edinburgh was going, at this time, was going through a spell of becoming much more educated and enlightened and, and numerous um, societies and clubs were springing up. And the membership of these clubs and societies in Edinburgh at that time um, came from a wide spectrum of members. You know, so from hugely powerful um, aristocrats uh, and lawyers or whatever um, down to you know ordinary artisan workers uh, and I think that's something that wouldn't generally have been seen in other countries when, when they talk about these societies and uh, and uh, clubs that existed to to discuss issues of the day and philosophy and things like that in Edinburgh they had a wide spectrum um, of, of people so you might say, how, why, how did this come about? What, what made this happen? Well, for that, we have to go back to 1513, when Scotland foolishly decided to invade England. Um, and it was a disastrous decision, um, and it resulted in the country's worst military defeat at the Battle of Flodden, uh, when the, the Scotland's king and many of their nobles were slaughtered in a terrible um, 
a terrible defeat. Um, so after that battle, the, the, the burghers, the, the fathers of, of Edinburgh, uh, fearing an invasion by the English army, um, which actually never came about, but decided to build a new city wall, uh, and they, they, it's called the Flodden Wall, and, and sections of it still exist today, and you can see it. Um, and an interesting aspect here that I, I want to highlight is whilst uh, ostensibly defence was the main reason for this wall, this is what the, the, the burghers of the city uh, said, uh, a secondary consideration, but probably one of equal importance to the, to the city fathers, yeah, was they wanted to control trade, they wanted to impose taxes and they wanted to stop smuggling. And they felt by building this wall around the city, they would achieve that. Um, so the main entrance, there were six uh, gates uh, to the to the through the walls at various stages around the city. But the main one was called the Nether Bowl, um, and that was located at uh, World's End Close. And uh, many of you may have heard of this World's End Close. It was called the World's End because for the citizens of Edinburgh, this was where their world ended. This is where the walls were. This was where this big, huge um, gate, and I'm, I'm just putting a picture out of it just now, uh, existed. Um, uh, so that's why it's called the World's End Close. And there is, a, there is um, of course, for many, many of you might know about this, there's a famous pub there called the World's uh, End Inn. Um, so well, if you are in Edinburgh, well worth a visit. Um, However, the wall never actually ever worked defensively. It, it, it never was successfully uh, defensively. Um, as an example of that, when the Jacobite army and, and during the 1745 rebellion and the Jacobite rebels arrived on the outskirts of Edinburgh, they managed to trick the guards and get in and they opened the gate up the netherbow and let them in. Um, which showed it wasn't really that well organised defensively. However, however, and this is what makes me think, defence wasn't really the main uh, the main issue for the city fathers. Um, what it did do very effectively was it limited the size of the city. So remember this is back in, in 1513 um, and, and so this defined the city will be this uh, and this was it, the Royal Mile and the closest running of it. Um, and, and so as the population grew uh, the, the city became more and more cramped and, and this accelerated as a population as we get into the 1700s as the population starts to soar um, and I'll explain why that happened um, it, this situation became worse and worse and worse and Daniel Defoe uh, the famous author of Robinson Crusoe he after a visit to Edinburgh once uh, he stated that he believed there was no city in the world um, where, where people had so little room in them uh, for themselves to live um, so one way that the, the city and, and, and the citizens of Edinburgh got round this was that, uh, and again this is, a, this is an impact it had and um, I think again quite unique at its time, was that if new homes couldn't be built outside the city walls, so in other words they, they couldn't spread out the ways, what would they do? They would go up the way. Um, so in his day, in this, at this time, Edinburgh became known uh, as the city with what we would today term today skyscrapers. Um, so a little bit like you know the, the modern cities that have you know these massive skyscrapers now, um, you know like New York or Dubai or Shanghai or places like that. Uh, Edinburgh was the corner of that in its day. Um, so they, 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 they started building these tenements higher and higher and higher and they, they could go up to 14 storeys. Now 14 storeys I suppose nowadays doesn't sound that much but if you think about it that must have been quite a sight in those days when generally you know uh, people lived in quite simple dwellings you know apart from uh, royalty and, and aristocrats most of the people lived in quite simple dwellings and all of a sudden if you were visiting Edinburgh you would see these massive stone structures soaring up um, and if you are again visiting Edinburgh you, you will still see examples of these ten buildings which are I even now are impressive so in those days in the 1700s I think it must have made quite an impact and as I said Edinburgh was that was something that was quite renowned about. So this was an impact of this decision to build the walls to, to restrict the city and to cram people in. So up, the, up they went. 
Um, however, the, the cramp conditions, you know, had other uh, knock-on effects. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. There, there probably are many, actually, and we could spend hours talking about them. But there's a couple, um, both of which are kind of well known, I, th I think. But the uh, first one was there was a terrible standard of sanitation, absolutely appalling. Oh. Um, so these high-rise tenements that they had succeeded in designing and building um, had no sanitation, no running water, no lavatories, either inside or outside. Um, toilets in those days were simply a chamber pot that would have to be emptied once a day. Uh, and this was a job, unfortunately, used, usually done by children or, or by uh, women. Um, so what the way they used to empty them out was they used to throw them out the window and throw it out the window and so what happened was uh, that the, there was a phrase became well known in Edinburgh in those days and, and the phrase was Gardy Lou um, now this is this is a, a, a corruption of the of the French phrase Gardy Lou uh, which means uh, watch out for the water so um, so the, they would open the window to to, to, <laughs> to the chamber pot and they would shout Gardy Lou um, and uh, this would be a warning to the, to the people down below that the contents of a, of a chamber pot would soon be thrown through the open window. Obviously this was not good for the citizens in this crowded Royal Mile because, you know, I, I don't think they gave them that much warning. I think they just shouted Gardy Lou and emptied the, the, the chamber pot. Um, and the problem became so bad um, and, and, and with with people in the Royal Mile regularly being covered covered with nasty contents of chamber pots that in, um, in 1749 a, an Act of Parliament was passed and it was called the Nastiness Act uh, and this decreed that chamber pots could not be emptied um, uh, unless it was between the hours of 10pm at night uh, and 7am the next morning and at 10pm at night uh, the the, the um, bells of St Giles High Kirk in the Royal Mile, the big, the big church, w would sound out, um, and th th from then until seven a.m. they were allowed to empty chamber pots, but they were still required by law to shout "Garde Lou" or "Gad Garde Lou", Lou, but uh, it it was corrupted to "Garde Lou". Um, I have seen it said, I'm not sure if this is true, that, that that then became why sometimes toilets nowadays are called loos and it was because of that. I don't actually know if that's true but I have seen that said, um, that, that this phrase that was shouted out regularly um, uh, out the window. And there was a famous story of, of a, um, a nobleman walking up the street and the, the, the Edinburgh wifey, I was going to say, that, yeah, woman she just shouted Garda Lou and, and threw the contents of the chamber pot out and covered him completely with it and it's quite a well-known story <laughs> ever so that was one issue which I think you know became quite well known that, that Edinburgh was known for terribly bad sanitation um, because of these cramped conditions um, another one I just want to highlight was crime there was a lot of crime there were murders. You, when you've got that many people crammed into such a tight space, um, then I suppose you would say it was an inevitable. Um, but one criminal that I, I, I like talking about, and I'm sure some of you have heard of him, but I think no criminal uh, exemplifies this strange social mix uh, of the Royal Mile more than this man uh, who was called Deacon Brodie. Um, so his, his full name is William Brodie and he was uh, a cabinet, ma cabinet maker um, and actually I have read that the, the phrase cabinet maker didn't just define that he made furniture which he certainly did and his father had done so before but also in some ways he was a bit like an architect I think as well and you know involved in renovating houses and doing things in houses and such like um, uh, so he he was a, he had a cabinet making business uh, and he was the deacon of the cabinet makers guild hence his, his name deacon Brodie, and he was also a councillor on the city council so here was a man 
very much uh, respected and admired um, in the city. Uh, and he lived uh, in a tenement at the top of the Royal Mile, at, at the section of the Royal Mile, quite up the top, that's called the Lawn Market. So that's where Deacon Brodie lived. Um, however, William Brodie, or Deacon Brodie as he would be known, to give him his title, by night was a completely different man. By night he was a housebreaker, a burglar, a thief. Um, and he used these ill-gotten gains um, to, to fund his love of gambling um, and also to, uh, to, to pay, I suppose, for, for his two mistresses uh, with, which he, with whom he had uh, five children. And in, interestingly, apparently, the, the mistresses, neither of the mistresses were aware of each other and I think it, it wasn't well known that he had these mistresses, apparently. Now, how he managed to do that and keep it quiet in the confines of the Royal Mile and have five children, yeah, that's a little bit beyond me, but that's apparently what it is. So, he loved gambling and he obviously loved women and um, had the mistresses. Um, and what, how he did it was he used his, his business as cabinet maker and architect, things like that. He was given access to people's houses you know, to, to do work or to plan out work and things like that. And he would make keys, he would copy keys or he would make keys, skeleton keys, that, that would allow him at night to break into these houses uh, and to rob them. Uh, and he had a small gang of, of, of three uh, men. Um, so this was Deacon Brodie living in the lawn market in a tenement along with everybody else. Um, However, this life of crime that he was enjoying came to an abrupt end when he, um, he tried to rob the excise office, which was probably a bit ambitious. Uh, there was an excise office in uh, a place called Chessel's Court, which still exists today, which is down in the Canongate section uh, of the Royal Mile. Uh, for those of you who perhaps remember, I used to have a business down there, so I know it quite well. Uh, and as a little historical aside, um, June's, my wife's June's, some of her relatives a long time ago lived in Chessel's Court. Anyway, the excise um, office was there and um, Deacon Brodie and his gang tried to rob it, but that, oh, they made a complete shambles. I don't actually think they were that efficient as burglars. I think the fact he was able to get the keys probably helped them, but anyway, uh, this uh, fled and members of his gang were caught and instantly, as is, I think, the norm, as there's no honour among thieves, they turned King's evidence. Uh, so anyway, Brody fled by ship um, to Holland, and he was hoping to get to America. That's where he was hoping to, he could get away to America, escape to America, and that would be him away. Um, but he was caught in Amsterdam, and he was sent back to Edinburgh. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he was tried, uh, found guilty, condemned to death, and he was publicly hanged outside the jail that used to exist in the Royal Mile called the Old Tolbooth, which was apparently, by all, by all histories, it, stories, it was an appallingly bad jail. Anyway, he was publicly hanged outside there, which is just, it, just next to St Giles's High Kirk. Uh, and there was a, apparently, this is the figure I've seen, a crowd of 40,000 people came to watch his uh, execution. It must have been a massive crowd. It must have been so many people came in from the, the country outside as well to see that. Um, so that was the end of the, this amazing man who lived this double life in amongst all these people. And this is the thing that amazes me. So he, he, they're living in this small area, this cramped conditions, and he is living this life of a respectable, admired businessman and counsellor and, and, and member of the guild and everything like that. And then subsequently, he's also, you know, a, a burglar, a thief, uh, with mistresses and children and everything like that. Um, and this was all happening in the Royal Well. Uh, the, if you've ever read or heard of, of Robert Louis Stevenson's famous novel, um, The Strange Case of, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, well, Deacon Brodie was the inspiration for that. Um, and there is, of course, in the Royal Mile, up near where he lived in the Lawn Market, there is quite a famous pub called the Deacon Brodie Tavern. So again, if you're in Edinburgh, try and go in there and uh, enjoy a libation of, of, or two. <laughs>
However, th this back to what we were talking about, this 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 amazing sort of what I would de 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 describe as a, as a social period in Edinburgh um, just couldn't last. Um, it, you know, the pressures were, were were getting too great, and what really happened then was following the Treaty of Union um, uh, with England. Uh, a, the need for the defensive wall was no longer needed, but B, more importantly, um, Edinburgh and Scotland prospered greatly from that moment on, um, and populations grew and grew and grew, and that, that's what caused this explosion of, of the population during the 1700s. You know, the economy was booming, people were prosperous, you know, the country was doing well. Um, so, the, the pressure became too great. And out of this, again, uh, so this shows you the, the impact of, the, of these events. Um, what happened then was that the, 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 fa the, the fathers of the city came up with this fantastic idea um, to launch a competition um, to design a new town for Edinburgh. So we had the old town, the Royal Mile, uh, and the, they came up with this idea for this competition to, to build a new town, to give new space. And it was going to be um, across what was called the Nor Loch, which is the North Loch, the North Loch, uh, it was abbreviated to Nor Loch, um, which was right next to where Princess Street Gardens is today, if you're in Edinburgh, that was a loch called the Nor Loch. And across the other side of the loch was where they would build um, this new town. Uh, anyway, I'll not go into that to great detail because that would be the subject for another video uh, so, but what resulted from that competition was a gem uh, of city planning that is renowned across the world and is a, is a world heritage site and is the most fantastic uh, set of buildings and streets elegantly designed uh, and such a wonderful uh, uh, heritage for the city and this was all created because of the pressure on the Royal Mail of the pressure on the council to do something and they, they came up a competition a young Scottish architect did the drawings and that was it however what happened then was as soon as construction began and 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 the 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 aristocrats and the, and the landed gentry and, and the the wealthy professionals of Edinburgh saw these fantastic houses going up they up sticks left, fled the crowded tenements uh, of the Royal Mile uh, and moved into their elegant Georgian mansions in the new town. Um, and then no longer in Edinburgh would everyone of all social classes and types, no longer would they all live cramped together in, these, in the same tenement. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little insight into what I, I find quite interesting that for this amazing period of time we had a completely different social mix uh, and, and social intimacy in Edinburgh. Um, if you do like it, then if you, if you would like it and share it with your friends, as always, I, I'm, I'm always very keen uh, for everybody to... to as many people as possible to see the video. Um, it's on my YouTube channel called Gordon Scotland, but as usual, I put a little link to it below and you can uh, watch it there. Um, so all that remains for me is is to, again, unfortunately, I keep having to say, I, I hope everybody's keeping safe during these difficult times and to wish you all the very best from Scotland.